much. Okay, so we're setting this up like we're doing a tour with a group of like seventh graders or high school students. So, welcome to Tracy Aviary. My name is TJ, and I'm going to be your tour guide today. And today our tour has a special theme. But before we get into that theme, I have a question. How many of you guys have ever designed anything? Either on paper or built something with something physical? Nice. Can you tell me what you built or designed? Clothes. Clothes? Nice. Did you get inspiration from anything for your clothes? Magazines. Magazines? Nice. So probably lots of things that other people designed as well, who maybe got inspiration from other people as well, so it's a cycle. How about you? Uh, I built a desk. Nice. Did you build it out of wood? Out wood. of... Nice. Did you... Um, I don't know anything about carpentry. Tell me a little bit more about it. Uh, it's made out of oak. Nice. Um, so it is uh, about waist height and probably about five foot by maybe three foot. Nice. Did you take inspiration from anything for it? Did you like look at an image or did you um, just A lot of the Amish, Amish style of literature. Nice. What I like to do cool. with that. Awesome. Anyone else? I designed a game one time. Yeah. It was a game where you put together, I didn't actually make it, but I designed the idea where you would put together different pieces of animals and then put it on a little reader thing and it would tell you what unique combination of adaptations your animal would have. Hmm, interesting, nice. And so where did you get your inspiration from for, for, for that? Um, probably like time I've spent outside in national parks. Nice, so maybe like observing nature. Mm -hmm. Nice. Well, that's actually going to be the theme of our tour today. Seacock has to put his two cents in. And so the theme is taking inspiration from nature to design things. And that actually has a special term that we use. So if we're thinking about copying life, what is another word for life? Does anybody Biology. know? Biology. Biology. And shorten that. Bio. Bio. And then how about a word, a synonym for copying, if you're copying something. Mm. Parrots do this. Yell. Any ideas? <laughs> no, not yelling. Not screaming, not bio screaming. <laughs> Any other ideas? Mimicking. So, <laughs> exactly, yeah. So another word for copy could be mimicking. So today we're going to talk about the subject of biomimicry. And biomimicry is just taking inspiration from nature to solve either simple or complex problems. So here's my little booklet of information for you guys. No, you're good. You're totally good. Just a practice run. <laughs> okay, so, as I was saying, taking ideas from nature to make our world better can either be simple or complex. And one really simple thing that we have taken inspiration from in nature are burrs. Have you guys ever been walking through the park and those like little things get stuck to your socks and shoes? If you ever, if, if you ever have examined them really, really closely, you'll notice they have small hooks on the ends of them, of each barb. So in the 1940s, a Swiss man was walking with his dog and he noticed these things building up all over his legs and his socks and all over his dog's fur. And he noticed these hooks were really good at getting themselves entangled in fibers. So for eight years, he took nylon twine and he created something called Velcro which had a really hard time uh, finding its way into mass use for a long time <coughs> until the 1960s when it was found to be very useful for astronauts who don't have a whole lot of dexterity when they're moving in their big spacesuits. So they found that they could use it on everything from pockets to fastening equipment to each other to even standing in place in zero gravity. They would have Velcro on the bottom of their shoes. So you can see these nylon hooks get entangled with smaller loops, and that's how Velcro works. They just all get entangled, and the combined strength of all those little hooks 
helps keep you in place. Now, it didn't have anything to do with keeping them in place, but they also found that they could use it on the inside of their helmets to scratch their nose on whenever. <laughs> <it happened. laughs> okay. Paper. So that's an example of something really simple that we have taken from, taken inspiration from in nature. Can anybody think of something complex that maybe humans have been trying for a really long time to do, but maybe only until recently, recent history were unsuccessful? Fly! Flight, exactly, yeah. So can you guys tell me when we first designed a flying machine? What year was it? 900. 900? Oop, no, not 900. Wait, like an attempted flying machine or one so, that like one flew. that actually flew oh, for the first time? <laughs> yeah, exactly. 1903. <laughs> I thought we were talking a thousand years later. Time, so right. It's okay. <laughs> so in 1903, the Wright brothers designed the first successful flying machine in Kitty Hawk, North Carolina, and they were bike mechanics to begin with, and so they had a little bit of engineering knowledge. And they observed how birds' wings worked and how they were flexible. So they designed their wings to also be flexible to shift for steering. And so you can see there are several different designs here, glider designs. And then their final design was an actual airplane that flew. So they had to design their own engine because all other engines on the market at the time were too heavy. So they had to use their engineering skills to create the first lightweight engine. So before these guys were successful, there is a really famous artist who attempted really hard to fly with all sorts of different kinds of machines. Does anybody know who that artist designer was? Leonardo da Vinci. Da Vinci, yeah, exactly. So Leonardo da Vinci was famous for his observations of anatomy on humans as well as animals, and he tried copying those things. So. He had some designs here for a flying machine that unfortunately was never successful. I don't know if he ever made a glider version of it that was actually successful, but I don't believe that that was the case. So we've observed how birds will use, we, we have observed how the Wright brothers have taken inspiration from birds to make flexible wings for control, but if a bird wants to travel faster, does anybody have any ideas what a bird would, would want to do with its wings? Flap. Maybe they would flap harder, maybe that might make them go faster. Tuck them in. Yeah, they would tuck them in, exactly. So a really good example of a bird that does that is the peregrine falcon, which I have an image of here. And the peregrine falcon is an ambush predator. So it's really small, but what it will do is it will fly high above its prey, which are usually other small birds, and it will dive bomb down on them and tuck its wings in super close to its body, which allows it to travel at speeds up to 240 miles an hour. So it is the fastest living animal on the planet. And then that way, its prey has no idea what's coming and is dead before it even knows what hit it. So it's a very efficient ambush predator. And a really good example of something that we have taken that inspiration from is for the F-111 jet, which, like most planes you can see here in this bottom image, has wings that extend out far to the side. But then when it wants to go faster, it has a really cool method of tucking its wings back to make itself more streamlined. And since we're talking about the falcon, unfortunately, since our falcon is just in our bird show, it doesn't have an actual exhibit, we can't go visit one, but I have a really cool piece here for you to check out. This is a peregrine falcon wing. And when things get old, they die. And we sometimes will save their body parts to use as education tools. So I wanted to get this out to show you guys a really good example of how 
the stiffness and the sharpness of the wing would be really helpful in a bird that wants to move really quickly and dive on its prey. So you guys can all go ahead and feel, yeah. Maybe for seventh graders and up, I could pass it around. Mm, I'd still or, or high yeah. school. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So you can see that it's. You could feel that it was very stiff. The feathers on this are very stiff and strong, and it has a very sharp edge, and that allows it to travel at great speeds, especially when it tucks in its wings. So we've talked about we've talked about birds that go fast. Now, who would we talk about when we're thinking about birds that want to be silent? <gasps> owls. Owls, exactly. Yes. And luckily, we have some owls on exhibit, so we're gonna go walk on over there and talk about them a little bit. Follow me. So up here, we have the great horned owl, and I want you guys to just take a few moments to look at it, maybe make some observations about its body, maybe its shape or its colors. Now, does anybody know what owls like to eat? Can anybody tell me? Mice. Yeah, they like to eat mice, they like to eat meat usually small mammals that are living on the ground. And they happen to hunt only during a certain part of the day. Maybe that's the wrong way to phrase it. Hmm. I know that owls word. Are, owls are nocturnal. Does anybody know what that means? Can anybody tell me what nocturnal means? Yeah. They sleep during the day and are active at night. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So. They, just like the last bird we talked about, the peregrine falcon, are ambush predators. But unlike the peregrine falcon, these guys hunt animals that are on the ground. So when they're ambushing their prey, they need to approach a little bit more slowly and need to be a little sneakier. So they've developed some really great adaptations for that. And I'm going to pull out a wing for everybody to see. So here we have a great horned owl wing. And the great horned owl has some really awesome adaptations to help it fly silently and sneak up on its prey. And one of those adaptations is just being very soft. Their feathers are very soft as well as their wings being densely packed with feathers. So if you were to feel this feather, you'd feel, if you were to feel this wing, you would notice it's very thick with feathers. Now it also has some serrations on the leading edge of the wing. So as it's flying along, as most birds fly along, they disturb the air. It's called turbulence. And that often causes sound. When you swing a stick really fast, you'll hear a whooshing sound. And that's caused by the turbulence and the vibration of that stick. But these little things cause micro turbulences, which means just tiny little disturbances that, are, that break up the air before the whole rest of the wing passes through it. And so that allows it to travel silently through the air. So can anybody think of some things in our human world that we might have designed and made more silent with inspiration from the owl? Any ideas? Any vehicles, maybe? Trains? Hmm, yeah, definitely trains. Yeah, so on the bullet train, there's a top portion that used to be designed in a pole-like structure. And like I said, if you swing a pole through the air, it's going to make a loud whooshing sound. And since bullet trains travel so quickly, they're really loud. So they redesigned that structure that attaches the train to the electric wires above to have serrations along the edge, just like the leading edge of this wing, to help break up air as it passes over it. Nice. So that's an example of a vehicle that we have changed to help make it quieter. Can anybody think of anything else? Fans. <laughs> exactly, yeah, fans. So fans are a really big contributor to noise a lot of the time, especially in like industrial areas. So I have an image here of a fan that has been modified to more closely model the owl wing. So, like this owl wing, you'll notice is also very wide. And in this image, it's also shown to have a deep bowl shape. So the width and the bowl shape allow it to fly slowly and silently. 
And so they designed these blades to also have a wide and a bowl-like shape. And instead of having serrations on the leading edge of the blade, these are actually the tailing edge of the blade. So in their tests, they found that the tailing edge on these metal blades worked better at, at making it more silent. So this would decrease noise up to 15 decibels, which is like the sound of leaves rustling kind of loudly. So it's not a super ton of noise, but it can be a considerable amount if there's a lot of things going on or a lot of them going. It also increased their efficiency by 15%. So, yeah. Okay, let's check it out. So, we've talked about how structures can help make a bird fly silently, but structures might also have another surprising purpose, and we're gonna go meet a bird that uses some structures in that way. So you guys can follow me now. So in this exhibit, we have some macaws, which are a special type of parrot that are known for being very, very colorful. So I allow people now to take a few moments to look them over. Notice what colors you see. I see a lot of green, a little yellow, lots of red. Do you guys see any other colors? I see red. Oh, you said blue? Yeah, blue is also a color. Hey, it's over here. Some was like, So, you guys might have learned that white light is actually made up of all the colors of the rainbow. Have you guys ever played with a glass prism, which is like one of those glass triangle things? Yeah. You might have done an experiment where you shine a light through it, maybe sunlight, maybe a flashlight. And when you do that, the light waves are broken up and separated so that the white light is separated into all its separate colors of the rainbow. And so light is just made of waves and all color is, is our perception of different sized wavelengths of light. So red light has a really wide wavelength, and wavelength is just the distance between the peaks on each wave. So red is really low energy and has a wide wavelength, whereas purple has very high energy and you can see the waves are really close together. So the glass of the prism slows down the white light until they all separate. And <coughs> most animals in nature use pigments to color themselves. So that's like natural dyes. But there is one color on these birds that actually isn't a natural pigment or dye. Can anybody think of what color that might be? Blue. <laughs> Sorry. That might be a color. Do you guys think you might know what color is not like a dye on their feathers. It's an illusion. Any ideas? I like blue. He likes blue. Nice. Yeah. So, blue is very difficult for nature to make. But lots of animals have discovered a way to trick us into seeing blue. And because light waves, light is made up of different waves, you can make structures on your body to interact with those waves if you make them small enough. So, a great example of that would be the Morpho Butterfly, which is kind of like an iridescent, shiny blue color. But if you were to crush up those wings, there wouldn't be any blue color left in there. There wouldn't be any real blue. And the reason we see blue is because when white light hits their wings, there are tiny, 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 tiny little things on their wings that interact with the light waves. And they do something called constructive interference, which means that the waves interfere with each other in such a way that it cancels out all certain colors and amplifies all of one certain color. 
So with morpho butterflies, they have this very specific, almost looks like a pine tree arrangement. But on a lot of birds, what they have are just an arrangement of molecules that do the same job. They interact with light in the same way, canceling out waves in a certain wavelength and amplifying some of others. So just like with the butterfly, if you were to crush up a blue feather, just like this one here, you wouldn't see any more blue pigment in it. So you can see how it looks really blue right now, right? But if I hold it up to the sun a little bit more, does the blue kind of disappear? Does it look more gray? Yeah, that's because light has to hit the surface of this in order for those structures to interact with light in such a way that you see blue color. And you can see on this feather, it appears that the structures actually fade away and no longer exist on the back half of it. So you can see it becomes very vibrant when I hold it up in the sun. So you see it this way, and then if I hold it directly up overhead, you don't see any more of the blue. But the yellow on this feather is true pigment. So the yellow is like a dye. So this came from a blue and gold macaw. And this one came from a, I believe, a green winged macaw. So it also has blue on there, but instead of having yellow on the bottom, it has red pigments on the bottom. Do you guys want to feel this feather? Do you want to feel it? These are really colorful, huh? I really like parrot feathers because of how colorful they are. There are lots of different nanostructures with lots of different jobs in nature. And we talked about how the owl uses their, nano, their structures to help them move silently through the air. And how birds use microstructures in their feathers to make us see certain colors. But sometimes microstructures can even be used to help you stay clean. So the lotus leaf, and a lotus is this flower here on the front of my binder. The lotus, because when water falls on it, water can't penetrate these little things and they ball up like this. And they ball up like this because they have something called surface tension. So they stick together and they don't stick to the surface of the leaf and they just roll off. And as the beads of water roll off the leaf, they carry any dirt off of them. It might be clogging up the pores of the, of the leaf. Another really cool use for microstructure is, clean, is, is cleanliness on a viral level or a bacterial level. And sharks, we discovered, are really good at keeping algae from growing on their backs. Because if you've ever noticed maybe in a pool or in a stream, there's lots of green algae growing on rocks and flat things. But they have tiny microstructures on their scales that keep tiny little germs and bacteria from growing on them so they don't have any of that plant gross stuff growing on their backs. And so we took that idea and we made things in hospitals that have surfaces with those same patterns. And those surfaces help keep diseases from spreading in hospitals because that can be a place where people go when they're sick. So we wanna make sure that disease isn't being spread. So that's a cool idea we took from sharks. Cool. Now we talked about microstructures. Now we're going to talk about a big structure on a bird. So we're going to move to another exhibit to talk about that. So you guys can follow me. We're doing a test run of my intern project tour. <laughs> Thanks for being an audience, guys. So the next bird that we're theoretically going to see is the Guam Kingfisher. Ooh, okay, I found it. Great. So 
Guam Kingfisher's really tiny bird. And as you can probably guess by its name, this bird likes to eat fish. And the way that it likes to fish is it'll hang out above the water and it'll scour and it'll wait for the opportune time before diving straight down in and taking a big bite of whatever they think they're gonna find. And their beak is specially designed to be really resistant to splashing. So the sharp point of their beak penetrates the water very efficiently without disturbing any water around it. So as you can see in this example, if it were a rounder shape beak of a bird trying to fish this way, then the shock waves might disrupt the fish and scare it away before it can even reach it in the water. So this sharp beak is a really great adaptation for allowing them to be excellent ambush predators on fish. So can anybody think of a vehicle who we might have modeled their design off the beak of the kingfisher? Trains in Europe. Trains in Europe? Hmm, maybe trains in Europe. But you're on the right track. They were trains, but they're a special kind of train. Any ideas? Ones that went through tunnels. Definitely ones that go through tunnels. But this kind of train has a special name, and it's in Japan. Bullet trains. Bullet trains, exactly. So, in 1989, the design of the bullet train was kind of like a rounded shape. Kind of like what maybe some bullets actually look like. But these trains travel over 200 miles an hour. So they're pushing a lot of air out of the way. And have you guys ever been out on the street or in a car and heard an ambulance approaching you and the pitch gets higher as it comes towards you and then gets lower as it goes away from you? So that's called the Doppler effect, and that's sound waves being pushed or pulled away from you, or I'm sorry, being stretched away from you, which causes the pitch to change. But as the train was traveling through tunnels, it would compress those sound waves. Because the train was moving so fast, those sound waves weren't able to travel very far ahead of it as it traveled through tunnels. And then as it exited the tunnel, that compressed air in front of the train would cause a sonic boom that blasted out across the urban area. So obviously that's a big problem because people are living around that. They don't want noise that can blow out windows to be occurring on a daily basis. So an engineer designed the, king, designed the bullet train, redesigned it after the Kingfisher's beak, and he happened to be a bird watcher and the head engineer on the team. So like we talked about earlier, the pentagraph on top of the train, which connects it to the electric wires above, was redesigned using inspiration from the owl. And so that was the same guy who took that same, I'm sorry, it was the same guy who designed that part of the train who also took inspiration from the kingfisher to design a more efficient nose shape, Ooh. which is extremely aerodynamic and efficient and caused it to be up to 15, I'm sorry, that was the last one, 25 decibels quieter in urban areas. So that would be like uh, a hair dryer being turned off and you're like, oh, fine, fine. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's see. So that's the end of the tour. If you guys have any questions for me, you're absolutely welcome. Theoretically, if someone should, should, should choose, they can do an activity where they shorten the tour and they get in groups and they try and design something based off of nature. So they talk about three things that they like to do or like to make, and then they'll pick one of those things and try and think of something in nature that they could take inspiration from to redesign that. So thank you very much for coming on my biomimicry tour. Yay! Pleasure taking you around.